we all have our, our own spiritual battles to face. And I don't want to diminish the battles each individual has to deal with. But I will tell you, there's nothing tougher. Hmm. Is It's up there in the difficulty zone to watch a loved one or somebody you care deeply about and watch them deal with substance abuse. Sometimes I think the people who get latched on to substance, whatever it's, sometimes it's prescription pain pills, alcohol, drugs, whatever, they don't think about how the other people, how it affects the other people around them. Because that's, it's the nature, by the way, all of these things. I'm focusing on this, but you can make it apply to anything in that realm of self-centeredness. the deification of self. Remember the big circle Dr. Scott used to make on the board and the S in the middle, the self? And you can apply that to just about any aspect of your life. To become so self-consumed and so self-absorbed that you also fail to recognize the very people around you who love and care for you the most are suffering with you in what you let yourself become entangled with. I'm, I'm telling you, it's one of those things that I often, I encounter prayer requests and I, I think, you know, I can't say this enough. There is that dimension of, to coin the word, of prodigality in each and every one of us wandering off in a far country. And it's sometimes very hard because you've got to watch people you love. It could be yourself and it could be somebody else. The waiting time until someone comes to their senses, until they come back to themselves. It's like watching somebody die. Or maybe it's you. But we never think about how this affects other people around us, the people who love us, who put up with our stuff. And people say, please pray for me to be delivered. I sometimes feel, and I'm going to say it now, I sometimes, I wish I could tell each of those people, oh, I do pray for your deliverance because Jesus said he came to free the captives and deliver people, yes, open the eyes of the blind and, and heal the sick of, of, of every dimension, of every disease. But on the flip side, those people who are in that realm, if they could get away from that that super S called the self, and look around and watch all the people around them suffer. Because when you love somebody, you, I'm talking to you family members, or you friends, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, you have to watch the person suffer, but you yourself are suffering too. Because it's, it's something that spills over into every dimension of your life. So I feel like telling those people that call and they say, please pray for my deliverance. I feel like telling you, I'm telling you now. You should start praying for your deliverance and asking God for your deliverance and be grateful that the people around you have st stood by you and recognize that your disease has become their disease too. That maybe will jar you into opening your eyes of what you have succumbed to. And this, these are very deep things for people who are not, who have never been around addicts or people who are consumed or addicted. It'll have no meaning to you. It'll have, you'll just say, wow, what's she talking about? But the people who have been, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's one of those things that it seems like the closer you are to a person, the, the, the less they listen to you. And the more you try to reach in and pull them out of that quicksand, the more you find yourself being pulled in because it's almost like at some point you have to let it go or you yourself will be sucked in to the very thing. I'm not saying you succumb to that disease, but that which has consumed the person. And I believe all these things stem from one place, Satan. 
How does he get control? Just open up a little crack, just a little temptation, just a little something over here. I'm not the type of person who says, well, don't ever take pain pills because you get addicted. The year Dr. Scott died, that same year, a few months down there, I had a very uh, pretty serious surgery. I had it between Sundays. And I was back in the pulpit on Sunday, but I had a drainage bag on my side, which was neatly tucked into my very baggy pants. And I was given pain pills. So I only took them once or twice, and I didn't like the way I felt. Doctor said, you need to take these for at least a whole week. Well, somebody else, that, if somebody else wants to do it, that's fine. I decided I took them once or twice, and that was enough for me. I didn't want to walk around feeling loopy. It's a decision. I'm not against that, but I'm saying that can become, for some people, you say, how does this happen? For some people, they have surgery, and they're given pain pills, and suddenly they realize, wow, I, I slept really good. I feel really good. Nothing's bothering me. And wow, I, I, before you know it, the whole bottle's gone. Hey, Doc. <laughs> One more round, please. I'm not saying anything can be abused. Anything. People don't understand that when it possesses you, that's when you've crossed the line. Most people wouldn't know these things. I'll tell you these little tidbits. Dr. Scott smoked, when I met him, he smoked a, a pipe, he smoked cigars. And then when, when we were married, I would get some of the worst Sinus headaches, severe, severe, like to the point of migraine. I've got to go lay down. My eyes are sensitive to light. And went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, it's pretty obvious that you have very sensitive sinuses and probably are allergic to that smoke. And of course, you know, <laughs> what do you do with that? But in a discussion with Dr. Scott, he said, well, there's only one thing to do. If it makes you that sick, I have to go outside and smoke. And guess what, folks? For the remainder of our marriage, that's what he did. There's a couple of eyewitnesses still around to attest to that. And I never said, hey, you can't smoke in the house. I would never dare say that. He was the one that said, I'll go outside. We used to have a screened porch in the back area of where we lived, and that's where he would go smoke. In fact, I actually built him a special room with a suction fan and all kinds of, I did, I did, I did. It was a modified room. It was my idea, I'd build a dome into the ceiling. I was a very creative person. Build a dome into the ceiling. And by the way, it was some of the people that are still in the church that built that dome. Put a fan in it and a suction reverse exhaust to pull the air out of the room so he could sit in there and smoke. He wouldn't sit in there and smoke. He used that room maybe a half a dozen times at best. Why? Because the smoke, even though it was being sucked out of the room and into the attic and eventually out of the house, it would permeate the rest of the house. And because I would still get sick, he didn't want to do that. So I want you to understand the fine line of things. If it's, if it's so... If it so possesses a person that they say, no, I can't give that up, or I can't, I can't go outside, then you know you have a problem for the sake of others around you. So what I'm saying to you is anything can, be, can become that, not just the substances we think of, anything. But it's always difficult for the people who love that person. Those are the people you really need to pray for as well because, yeah, the person needs to be delivered, but it's, those, it's the wear and tear on the family that after a time you just, you just want to throw up your hands. You, know, you pray and you pray, God, please deliver this person from that. Please help them. At some point you just want to throw up your hands and say, you know what, I just I give up. Well, don't give up. Don't stop praying. And some of you who are 
dealing with you yourselves, the concept of you are addicted. I want you to think about the people around you who you're dragging into your mess as well. And that should at least sober you for a little while if you love those people around you. I'm not even talking about God. That's a whole different dimension of things. You know, we all did stupid things when we were young. We all decided to experiment or try things just because it, our friends were doing it, because we were young, we were stupid. And you, hopefully you grow out of that stage and you do other stupid things in your life, <laughs> right? But imagine if you stay in that stage where you never grow out of it. And we all, looking back, uh, we, I say we all of a certain age, looking back would say, gosh, if I stayed there, I don't know if I'd still be alive today. It could be crazy living, it could be alcohol, drugs, doesn't matter. You, you move on eventually. Okay, I, I, I tried that. So, yes, I pray for those people to be delivered in Jesus' name. And, and, and it's not lip service. God is not looking for, for people to say, yes, I know God will deliver me. You who are in the grip of that have to cry out, you yourselves, in, in your prayer closet, in your time, really, absolutely fading, no question at all that the Lord will deliver. Just as sure as you don't question your salvation, you say, I, I, by faith, I reach out and I appropriate that which I cannot see. It's the same thing to be delivered. Then you begin ordering your steps as though you have been delivered, as though you have been set free. No, I'm no longer bound by that. You've got to start somewhere. 